Hello and welcome to the fourth part of a series of four lectures about St. John Henry Newman. We began with his life, and then we moved on to his sermons, and then last week we had his other writings, such as uh, his apologia, and his poetry, and his letters. And this week, this talk is about St. John Henry Newman's prayers, meditations, and devotions. I titled this lecture, Prayers, Meditations, and Devotions, but I will not actually attempt to distinguish what is a prayer, or a meditation, or a devotion, but I'll try to cover them all without categorizing them, and I, because I feel to do so would be a distraction. Newman's life was uh, one of conversion, as I've talked about before, always seeking the truth and moving closer to the truth. And of course, his prayer life was not static either. Um, it was a life of constant um, adaptation to his prayer, growth in his prayer life. And so it's interesting to start at a young age. Um, at age 14, Newman's mother gave him an Anglican Book of Common Prayer when he left for boarding school. And at age 15, we find him praying in thanksgiving to God for his conversion. And because he distrusted himself, fearing lest he fall into sin, for God to guard him from temptations of the flesh, and to give him strength when he was invited to dances with girls, that he would not be tempted to lust. From a collection of prayers Newman wrote in 1817, so he's still a teenager, maybe 16 or so, we find this one, which comes from Vincent Ferrer Blaise's uh, Pilgrim Journey. It's a good overview of Newman's whole spirituality throughout his whole life. <clears throat> so he's 16 writing this. Oh, who can tell the number and the heinousness of my sins? Who can show forth worthily the innumerable mercies of God or the benefits he continued to shower upon me, while I remained nevertheless in hardened obstinacy, till at last, O oh, incomprehensible goodness, he deigned to, to turn me about from the error of my ways, to open my eyes and to guide me into the right path, to give me his Holy Spirit and to make me fall down before him. O oh, God most merciful, enable me for Jesus Christ's sake to desire and try to imitate thee in thy forbearance, long-suffering, and great goodness. Let me praise thy name always, and remain steadfast in faith, till I shall have run my race, finishing my course with joy. Give me true repentance, and let me persevere to the end, one of thy elect. I will also read his prayer for evening, prayer for the evening, which has some prayers, uh, phrases similar to our third collect for Evensong, the, be the one that begins, Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. Lord, I thank thee that thou hast safely brought me to the end of this day. Protect me from the perils and dangers of the night. Let me rest in peace. Let me lay myself down piously and gratefully as if in death, knowing my spirit may this night be required of me. Give me grace that whenever that time comes, I may be prepared for it, and that when my soul parts from this body, it may hear the grateful words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Many of his prayers from this collection contain exact phrases from the Book of Common Prayer, so there is evidence that he was using it and internalizing the prayers. He composed for himself different sets of prayers for in the morning and in the evening. Four years later, in 1821, while studying at Trinity College, Oxford, Newman wrote in his private journal that his devotion to the Holy Eucharist was intense. The grace to perform self-examination became the subject of his prayers. He prayed, O oh God, grant me to grow in grace daily, and continually to examine myself, that I may know, always know how my accounts stand, when
whenever called upon to reckon for my stewardship. His journal entries reveal how faithfully Newman examined his behavior and his intense efforts to live a Christian life of perfection. He recorded his sins, defects, impure thoughts, pride, vanity, ambitions, ambitiousness, and anger, especially anger against his brother Frank. During his time at Trinity College, Newman also had periods of dryness or those difficulties in times of difficulty in praying. He called them times when he felt deficient or distracted. Here's an example of that. I can read religious books, the most spiritual, with great pleasure, and when so engaged, feel myself warmed to prayer and thanksgiving. But let the appointed hour of devotion arrive, and I am cold and dead. My head is full of God during the day, and particularly the salvation of others. And I can offer up heartfelt prayers in, this, in my solitary walk. But this dreadful listlessness comes on me morning after morning and evening after evening. My mind wanders so in prayer, it is quite shocking, he concludes. He also says, As to ill temper, hastiness of spirit, cruelty, harshness of speech, I have not advanced an inch. I pray, I pray against it every morning, and when I am entering into it, but my hard heart will have its own way. He uh, also does report some progress, for example, I trust that, though still very defective, I have not been so cruel to Francis since June 2nd when I took the sacraments. Francis' his brother, of course, and taking the sacrament being the Holy Eucharist, which was not received every week, but maybe you know, monthly or so back in those days in the Anglican Church. From 1824, Newman also prayed for different things each day of the week. Sunday, intercession for the extension of Christ's kingdom. Monday, for faith, holiness, etc. Tuesday, for good works, usefulness, etc. Wednesday, for Christ's church, particularly his ministers. Thursday, for heavenly wisdom. Friday, for deliverance from sin, for pardon and peace. Saturday, for strength and ready help. In 1825, he is by now an Anglican priest, and his notes indicate a further development in his intercessory prayer, much more detail and order. Each day of the week, he placed his intentions under three general headings, pray for, pray against, and intercede for. For example, on Tuesdays, I'm sorry, I meant Mondays. I have a typo in my own notes. Monday for humility, lowliness, poorness of spirit, meekness, gentleness, long-suffering, patience, forgiveness of injuries, preferring others to myself, modesty. Against pride, haughtiness, vanity, self-conceit, arrogance, self-sufficiency, rashness. Intercede for Oreo, his college, the provost and fellows individually, Trinity, his former college, the two universities, I assume Cambridge and Oxford, all professions, England, the British Isles, dominions, all nations, and my benefactor. The next major evolution in Newman's prayer life was his use of the Roman breviary. This came about after the death of his close friend, Horel Froude, in 1836. Froude's father suggested Newman take Froude's breviary as a personal memento. Newman accepted it and began to recite it daily, requiring at least three hours to pray. The breviary consists of eight different offices or times of prayer. Matins, laws, 
prime, terse, sext, known, vespers, and compliment. Newman said that bravery was an excellent form of private devotion and that it impressed upon him a truer sense of the excellence of the Psalms. He liked the shortness of the prayers in each office of the bravery. Interestingly, Newman objected to the excessive invocation of Mary and the saints, and all the offices and antiphons in honor of Our Lady. He also criticized the interruptions of the scripture readings by many saints' days. Despite these objections, Newman pushed for a wider use of the Roman breviary in the Church of England, and he prayed with the breviary when he lived at Littlemore with his small band of friends. Make sure you get a handout, a uh, two handout, oh, good. As an Anglican priest, Newman recommended people pray with the works of certain Anglican divines, such as Lancelot Andrews and Jeremy Taylor. These 17th century Anglicans were also known as Caroline divines because they were influential the theologians and writers in the Anglican Church who lived during the reigns of King Charles I and II. In the Latin, the Latin for Charles is Carolus, or which kind of became Caroline in the English. Newman himself prayed with prayers written by Andrews, so to understand Newman's prayer life, one must know a little bit about Lancelot Andrews. Lancelot Andrews lived from 1555 to 1626 and was an English priest and scholar who held high positions in the Church of England during the reigns of Queen Elizabeth I and King James II. Andrews was the spiritual father of Charles I. During the reign of King James I, Andrews served as Bishop of Chichester and oversaw the translation of the authorized or King James Version of the Bible. His most popular work has proven to be his Preces Private, or Private Prayers, which was published posthumously and has remained in print since renewed interest in Andrews developed in the 19th century, partially thanks to Newman and the Oxford Movement. Andrews' book of 96 sermons has been occasionally reprinted, and his sermons are considered among the most rhetorically developed and polished sermons of the late 16th and early 17th centuries. This is another good book. John Henry Newman, Prayers, Verses, and Devotions, published by Ignatius Press. I would just like to read the uh, introduction by Louis Bouillet, an oratorian from the 20th century. He's talking about Newman and Lancelot Andrews, Price says, Privita. Newman was quite captivated by the very personal, but also very Catholic, in every sense of the term, style of Andrews' praises, spiritual exercises of penance, confession of faith, praise, thanksgiving, and intercession, leading to a fully conscious participation in the Eucharistic mysteries, and ultimately to a whole life in God's presence in Christ. So taken was he, in fact, that he undertook to translate and adapt them. The original text was in Greek, for the general benefit of his contemporaries. It must be added that, to the end of his long life, Newman quite believed that in these exercises of Andrews, he had discovered that form of prayer which springs directly from the Word of God and leads to a life fully lived in Christ. Not only as a priest, but later on as a cardinal of the Roman Church, he would keep the Preces Private on his kneeler for his daily preparation and thanksgiving, before and after Mass, and for his most personal meditations. It can be said, therefore, that this work of Andrews, thus translated and adapted by Newman, and entirely woven of sentences from the Bible, the Fathers, and the ancient liturgies, should be considered the fundamental inspiration of all Newman's devotional writings. It opened the way to the special style and character which would be exhibited by whatever he would in the future write in this field. He 
In Andrew's devotions, each day has the following structure. Introduction, confession, prayer for grace, profession or creed, intercession, and praise. But each day the prayers are quite different. I'm just going to give you a sampler of each one of these uh, parts of the structure. Introduction. Through the tender mercies of our God, the day spring from on high hath visited us. Glory be to thee, O Lord, glory to thee, creator of the light and enlightener of the world. Of the visible light, the sun's ray, a flame of fire, day and night, evening and morning. Of the light invisible, the revelation of God, writings of the law, oracles of prophets, music of psalms, instruction of proverbs, experience of histories, light which never sets. God is the Lord who hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, yea, even unto the horns of the altar. And he goes on and on a little bit more. You can see it's very scriptural and uh, hymn-like from the ancient hymns and other hymns in the scripture. Here's the prayer for grace for the first day of the week. My hands will I lift up unto thy commandments which I have loved. Open thou mine eyes that I may, that I may see. Incline my heart that I may desire. Order my steps that I may follow the way of thy commandments. O Lord God, be thou to me a God, and beside thee none else, none else, naught else with thee. Vouchsafe to me to worship thee and serve thee, one, in spirit of truth, two, in reverence of body, three, in blessing of lips, four, in private and in public, five, to pay honor to them that have rule over me, by obedience and submission, to show affection to my own, by carefulness and providence, six, to overcome evil with good, seven, to possess my vessel in sanctification and honor, eight, to have my converse without covetousness, content with what I have, nine, to speak the truth in love, ten, to be not, no, ten, to be desirous not to lust, not to lust passionately, not to go after lust. Here's the profession for the third day of the week. I like this one because it's just a list of nouns and adjectives um, that all describe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and their being and their actions. So it's, in a, it's, a, it's a creed in a sense, but it's just you know, single words. Godhead, paternal love, power, providence, salvation, anointing, adoption, lordship, conception, birth, passion, cross, death, burial, descent, resurrection, ascent, sitting, return, judgment, breath and holiness, calling from the universal, hallowing in the universal, communion of saints and of saintly things, resurrection, life eternal. It's just a pretty simple statement of faith. Here's a selection from the intercession portion for another day. Typically the intercession sections are long, because like I said, Newman was really into intercession, but so was Lancelot Andrews, I guess. Remember those who bear fruit and act nobly in thy holy churches, and who remember the poor and needy. Recompense to them thy rich and heavenly gifts, vouchsafe to them for things earthly, heavenly, for corruptible, incorruptible, for temporal, eternal. Remember those who are in virginity and purity and ascetic life, and also those who live in honorable marriage in thy reverence and fear. Remember, it, remember every Christian soul in affliction, distress, and trial, and in need of thy pity and succor. Also our brethren in captivity, prisons, chain, and bitter bondage. 
supplying return to the wandering, health to the sick, deliverance to the captives. Newman was big on intercessory prayer. He said that intercession is the characteristic of Christian worship, the privilege of heavenly adoption, the exercise of the perfect and spiritual mind. For example, his list of names in 1835 was about 45 persons, but in following years it expanded to hundreds of names. He also prayed for the dead. Shortly after Froude's death, Newman wrote, Praying for the dead is so very natural, so soothing, that if there is no command against it, we have, it would seem, a call to do it. And it is so great a gift, if so, to be able to benefit the dead, that I sometimes am quite frightened at the thought of how great a talent our church is hiding in a napkin. Now to look at prayers, meditations, and devotions, which are original to Newman. This is that little brown book that I love so much, and it really helped me get through seminary. Some of these have the dates indicating when Newman wrote them. They were found in his room after his death and compiled by his, his executors. Newman, like many others, meditated best with pen and paper in hand. This practice he began before his conversion, and he mentions it in a number of his sermons. His meditations are full of doctrine. He would have nothing vacuous and sentimental. In his meditations, he made church doctrine his own, lodged in his heart. William P. Neville, an oratorian and the executor of Newman's unpublished works, wrote in 1893 that the papers in this book were to have formed part of what Newman proposed to call a yearbook of devotion for reading and meditating according to the seasons and feasts of the year. However, Newman never got around to completing the full work, and all we have found so far are these. Apparently, Newman destroyed numerous writings when his close friend Ambrose St. John died because he intended to have St. John review them. In this book, we have three sections. From the Table of Contents, Part 1 contains Meditations on the Litany of Loretto for the month of May. Uh, one meditation for each day of May, beginning with Mary as the Immaculate Conception, seven meditations there, moving on to the Annunciation, seven there, Our Lady's Dolores, seven of those, and then the Assumption, eight of those. Then he has a memorandum on the Immaculate Conception, a novena of St. Philip, litany of St. Philip, 
course, St. Philip Neri, his spiritual father. And then, yeah, Novena of St. Philip and Litany of St. Philip in English and another, it's the same one in Latin. Now we're gonna have a little fun. Just need someone to pick a number between one and 31 and just shout it out. 10. All right, 10, thank you. It's an awkward pause there for a moment. But... So from May 10th, because you picked number 10, May 10th, on the Annunciation, I'm just gonna read the short little meditation. Well, medium length. Mary is the Regina Angelorum, the Queen of Angels. This great title may be fitly connected with the maternity of Mary, that is, with the coming upon her of the Holy Ghost at Nazareth after the angel Gabriel's annunciation to her, and with the con consequent birth of our Lord at Bethlehem. She, as the mother of our Lord, comes nearer to him than any angel, nearer even than the seraphim who surround him, and cry continually, Holy, Holy, Holy. The two archangels who have a special office in the Gospel are St. Michael and St. Gabriel, and they, both of them, are associated in the history of the Incarnation with Mary. St. Gabriel, when the Holy Ghost came down upon her, and St. Michael, when the Divine Child was born. St. Gabriel hailed her as full of grace and as blessed among women, and announced to her that the Holy Ghost would come down upon her, and that she would bear a son who would be the Son of the Highest. Of St. Michael's ministry to her on the birth of that divine son, we learn in the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, written by the Apostle St. John. We know our Lord came to set up the kingdom of heaven among men, and hardly was he born when he was assaulted by the powers of the world who wished to destroy him. Herod sought to take his life, but he was defeated by St. Joseph's carrying his mother and him off into Egypt. But St. John in the Apocalypse tells us that Michael and his angels were the real guardians of mother and child, then and on other occasions. First, St. John saw in a vision a great sign in heaven, meaning by heaven the church or kingdom of God, a woman clothed with the sun and with the, and with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And when she was about to be delivered of her child, there appeared a great red dragon, that is, the evil spirit, ready to devour her son when he should be born. The son was preserved by his own divine power, but next the evil spirit persecuted her. St. Michael, however, and his angels came to the rescue and prevailed against them. There was a great battle, says the sacred writer. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and that great dragon was cast out, the old serpent who was called the devil. Now as then, the Blessed Mother of God has hosts of angels who do her service, and she is their queen. That was a good one, thanks. Just um, to show his devotion for St. Philip Mary, here's one of his prayers to him. Philip, my glorious patron, gain for me a portion of that gift which thou hast so abundantly. Alas, thy heart was burning with love. Mine is all frozen toward God and alive only for creatures. I love the world, which can never make me happy. My highest desire is to be well off here below. O oh my God, when shall I learn to love nothing else but thee? Gain for me, O Philip, o a pure love, a strong love and an efficacious love, that loving God here on earth, I may enjoy the sight of him, together with thee and all saints hereafter in heaven. In the second part of this book, we have meditations on the Stations of the Cross, um, and then a short set of meditations on the Stations of the Cross. So we have two sets of Stations of the Cross. Then we have 12 meditations and intercessions for Good Friday with prayers for the faithful departed, meditations for eight days, and then several litanies, litany of penance, litany of the passion, etc., etc. We have his translation of the Anima Christi, and then prayers, miscellaneous things like uh, 
the Heart of Mary, a short service for Rosary Sunday, the Ave Marie Stella, a tribute to St. Joseph, four, four more prayers to St. Philip, a short road to perfection, then two short prayers, prayer for the light of truth, which I think is on your handout. The handout, by the way, is just for you to take home and uh, pray with and get some, some examples of Newman's prayers from these different sources in your hands. And then a prayer for a happy death. Thought I'd give you a little sampling of Stations of the Cross. This is, I think this is the long set of stations. Yeah. The longer set. Second station, Jesus receives his cross. We adore thee, O Christ, and we bless thee, because by the holy cross thou hast redeemed the world. He says, a strong and therefore heavy cross, for it is strong enough to bear him on it when he arrives at Calvary, is placed upon his torn shoulders. He receives it gently and meekly, nay, with gladness of heart, for it is to be the salvation of mankind. True, but recollect, that heavy cross is the weight of our sins. As it fell upon his neck and shoulders, it came down with a shock. Alas, what a sudden and heavy weight have I laid upon thee, O Jesus! And though in the calm and clear foresight of thy mind, for thou seest all things, Thou wast fully prepared for it, yet thy feeble frame tottered under it when it dropped it down upon thee. Ah, how great a misery is it that I have lifted up my hand against my God! How could I ever fancy he would forgive me, unless he had himself told us that he underwent his bitter passion in order that he might forgive us? I acknowledge, O Jesus, in the agony and anguish of my heart, that my sins it was, that struck thee on the face, that bruised thy sacred arms, that tore thy flesh with iron rods, that nailed thee to the cross, and let thee slowly die upon it. Here's the Short meditations on the stations. Um, the fourth station, Jesus meets his mother. There is no part in the history of Jesus, but Mary has her part in it. There are those who profess to be his servants who think that her work was ended when she bore him, and after that she had nothing to do but disappear and be forgotten. But we, O Lord, thy children of the Catholic Church, do not so think of thy mother. She brought the tender infant into the temple, she lifted him up in her arms when the wise men came to adore him. She fled with him to Egypt. She took him up to Jerusalem when he was twelve years old. He lived with her at Nazareth for thirty years. She was with him at the marriage feast. Even when he had left her to preach, she hovered about him. And now she shows herself as he toils along the sacred way with his cross on his shoulders. Sweet mother, let us ever think of thee when we think of Jesus. And when we pray to him, ever aid us by thy powerful intercession. From the meditations for eight days, I thought I would give you an example of these. These or a set of meditations he wrote in an attempt to teach a young invalid to meditate for Monday, guardian angel, place yourself in the presence of God kneeling with your hands clasped. Read slowly and devoutly Psalm 95 as it is found, uh, Psalm 90 as it is found in Compline. Bring all you have read before you as if you saw the angels protecting you, especially your guardian angel. Then say to God whatever is suggested to you, for instance, He hath given His angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways, 
In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. O my God, I will go forward in thy way, for my guardian goes with me. I am very blind. I do not know what is before me. I know not what will happen to me in life. I do not know whether I shall live long or die young. But this I know, that in health and sickness, in joy and sorrow, in youth and age, thou wilt be with me. O my sweet guardian, how beautiful thou art, I wish I could see thee. And thou art as pure and holy as thou art beautiful, and thy breath inspires chaste thoughts, and as gentle and kind as thou art pure. God of angels, have mercy on me. Queen of angels, pray for me. Part 3 of this book has Meditations on Christian Doctrine. Begins with a short visit to the Blessed Sacrament before meditation. Then we have the actual meditations beginning with hope in God the Creator, hope in God the Redeemer, God and the Soul, seven meditations on sin, one on the power of the cross, three on the resurrection, three on God with us, one on God all sufficient. God alone unchangeable, God is love, the sanctity of God, the forty days teaching, the ascension, the Holy Spirit, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and then one on the Sacred Heart, the infinite perfection of God, the infinite knowledge of God, the providence of God, God is all in all, God the incommunicable perfection, God communicated to us, God the soul stay for eternity. And you may have guessed, I will give you an example. Hope in God, the Creator. Number two. Oh, I need to say, each of these has um, three paragraphs. The first one is an exposition of some divine truth. The second one is how that particular truth touches our fallen human nature. And the third is a call for the individual to surrender to the Incarnation and the Cross. God was, in, God was all complete, all blessed in Himself, but it was His will to create a world for His glory. He is Almighty and might have done all things Himself, but it has been His will to bring about His purposes by the beings He has created. We are all created to His glory. We are created to do His will. I am created to do something or to be something for which no one else is created. I have a place in God's counsels, in God's world, which no one else has. Whether I be rich or poor, despised or esteemed by man, God knows me and calls me by my name. That's the exposition of that truth. Now, how that touches our fallen human nature. Paragraph 2. God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I may never know it in this life, but I shall be told it in the next. Somehow I am necessary for his purposes, as necessary in my place as an archangel is in his. If indeed I fail, he can raise another, as he could make, make the stones children of Abraham. Yes, I have a part in this great work. I am a link in the chain, a bond of connection between persons. He has not created me for naught. I shall do good, I shall do his work. I shall be an angel of peace a preacher of truth in my own place, while not intending it, if I do but keep his commandments and serve him in my calling. Third paragraph, call for the individual believer to surrender. Therefore I will trust him. Whatever, wherever I am, I can never be thrown away. If I am in sickness, my sickness may serve him. In perplexity, my perplexity may serve him. If I am in sorrow, my sorrow may serve him. 
My sickness or perplexity or sorrow may be necessary causes of some great end, which is quite beyond us. He does nothing in vain. He may prolong my life, he may shorten it. He knows what he is about. He may take away my friends, he may throw me among strangers. He may make me feel desolate, make my spirit sink, hide the future from me. Still, he knows what he is about. O Adonai, O ruler of Israel, thou that guidest Joseph like a flock, O Emmanuel, O Sapientia, I give myself to thee. I trust thee wholly. Thou art wiser than I, more loving to me than I am myself. Deign to fulfill thy high purposes in me, whatever they be. Work in and through me. I am born to serve thee, to be thine, to be thy instrument. Let me be thy blind instrument. I ask not to see, I ask not to know, I ask simply to be used. In conclusion, Newman was not a spiritual writer. He does not try to move his reader or readers to devotion through emotion. He prayed in his own way. He had a lively mind so he could not bear long periods of silence. He liked to have a lot of material for his prayers, and he did a lot of thinking about biblical texts while praying. He did not always enjoy prayer, but frequently found it more of a duty than a pleasure. Since he suspected that pleasure in prayer might bring with it less useful feelings, like pride, he preferred prayer to be sober, quiet, and calm. He needed forms, regular words, short, simple, easy to use, and never elaborate so that they could over-occupy the mind and tempt it into formality. Newman's prayers resound with his great humility and a personal conviction of his own sinfulness, but also a profound sense of the majesty of Almighty God and his love for us as expressed through Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. Thus, when we pray one of Newman's prayers, we are, like him, reaching out to God with our own heart. We speak to God's heart with our own heart. For that I say thank you, St. John Henry Newman.